While staying at the Royal Hotel in New Orleans, I had a terrible nightmare. In the dream, I woke up inside of a tent somewhere in the Arctic after a body in a body bag fell out of the sky. I wanted to stay inside of the tent, but I thought, man, a body just fell out of the sky. You might want to check it out. So I unzipped the body bag, and there was a dead guy with light brown hair inside. He had a note inside his shirt pocket. I pulled it out and read it. It was a love letter to my girlfriend. It said, Now you know how much I truly love you. At that point, the corpse opened its eyes and stood up. I was so annoyed that this asshole zombie thing was hitting on my girlfriend by committing suicide that I took him by the shoulders and escorted him out of the Arctic to the parking lot. In the dream, there was a parking lot around the entire Arctic. Okay, it's a dream. They don't always make sense. Just go with it. Anyway, I told him to get out and stay away from me and my girlfriend. Then I followed him to where he lived. The place had lit candles everywhere, and I thought it looked like a shop of some sort. I was still so mad at him that I took a piece of sharp metal and slashed up his face. It was such a gruesome dream that I actually wrote it down when I woke up. The next night I was in the hotel bar and I asked the bartender if there were any ghost stories attached to the hotel, it being New Orleans and all. She told me there was a ghost story, but they weren't supposed to talk about it. She told me anyway. In October of 2006, not long after Hurricane Katrina, a guy named Zach Bowen killed his girlfriend and dismembered her body in an apartment that they shared above a voodoo shop in the French Quarter. Then he came to the Omni Hotel, went up to the rooftop terrace, and jumped to his death. He had a suicide note in his pocket. The bartender said that people have reported seeing a shadowy figure leaping from the building ever since. I got on the internet and looked up the story, and I found a picture. And he looked just like the guy in my dream. This is what he wrote in the actual suicide note. This is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol car to 823 North Rampart, you'll find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend, Addie, in the oven, on the stove, and in the refrigerator, as well as a full signed confession from me. Signed, Zach Bowen. I had been completely unaware of any of this before my dream. I've had my fair share of encounters working nights in various nursing homes. When you have that many people pass away in one place, you're bound to have a few stick around. Three of my favorites are as follows, and to this day, I'm at a loss to explain how any of them happened. Story 1 Late one night, a picture of the Virgin Mary was removed from the wall and thrown 15 feet down the hallway from where it was hanging. It was lying face down on the floor, but totally unbroken. All of the people who worked there were at the nurse's station, so we know none of us did it. Could it have been a resident? I don't know how, because everyone on that floor was bed-bound, and all of them were asleep when we checked. Story number two. I once had two of my CNAs come to me almost in tears because they were so scared and confused. They found one of the residents and all of his bedding on the floor in the middle of the night. Not only was this particular resident bedbound, but he was also unresponsive. Yet the sheet, bed pad, pillow, and all of his covers were on the floor with him under them, just how we put him to bed earlier but on the floor. It looked as if someone had just picked him up like a baby with all of his bedding and gently laid him down on the floor, all tucked in. And story number three. I was doing rounds one night in another facility that was supposed to be haunted. The elevators were down, so we had to check all four floors by using the stairs. Through the years, this building had been used as a Civil War hospital a tuberculosis clinic, 
and then a psychiatric nursing home. The third and fourth floors were the ones that were supposed to be haunted, so of course nobody wanted to go up there alone. But I told the others to put on their big girl panties and we'd all go up together. As I was just starting to climb the steps from the second to the third floor, a pair of unseen hands pushed me, hard. So hard, in fact, that I fell backwards and down a few steps. Needless to say, after that, the others flat out refused to go any further, and I finished the rounds alone. These stories don't even begin to cover all of the things I've seen, heard, and experienced in nursing homes through the years. If you don't believe in the paranormal, just go work nights in a nursing home for a month or two. You'll change your mind. In my first apartment, my roommate and I had two bedrooms that were connected in the middle by the bathroom, like on the Brady Bunch. There was a long mirror that ran the length of the wall on one side. The tub and toilet were located on the opposite wall. So you could basically watch yourself as you showered because we had a glass shower door. About a week after we moved in, I was in the shower and the door to my roommate's bedroom opened slightly. She wasn't home, but I shrugged it off thinking maybe the AC had blown it open a bit. I bent over to get the shampoo and upon standing up again, I saw a pale middle-aged man with dark hair and a bushy mustache staring at me in the mirror. I screamed and looked around for anything I could find to use to defend myself. I grabbed the loofah with that long stick on it and opened the shower door, ready to fight whoever it was that was standing there. But nobody was there. I grabbed a towel and ran into my room. I checked all of the possible hiding spots, armed with my loofah stick. I checked under the beds, in closets, in the pantry, etc. But I found nothing. The front door and windows were locked, and my roommate wasn't home, so I just put it down to my imagination and moved on. But the next day, I heard my roommate screaming in the bathroom. Guess who showed up for her shower, too? We named the ghost Fred, and we'd catch him spying on us every now and then when we showered. He never tried anything just watched. Pervert. This happened when I was a child, but it's always stuck with me. My parents had just bought a new house. This was right after the prices went way up in the early 2000s. The house we were moving into was a total dump because it's all we could afford. Before we bought it, it was a crack house. Most of the windows were broken, the fence had been knocked down by the police when they raided it, and we found used needles in the garbage disposal. Mom and Dad had to fix it up a lot before we could move in. Dad would go over after work to do repairs and paint. He came home one night and said, When I got to the house today, I saw a little kid. He said he saw a boy walking down the hallway into the master bedroom, but when he went in there, the room was empty. At first he thought we had been there and left one of our friends behind, but when he realized that we weren't there, he didn't know what to make of the situation, and it kind of scared him. Mom just said that the fumes from the paint were making him imagine things, and that he should open a window and use a mask from now on. Keep in mind, though, my dad is not the type of person to believe in any kind of ghost or paranormal thing, and he didn't really scare easily, so this was kind of out of character for him. Right after we moved in, my little sister began talking to an imaginary friend, a little boy named Mikey. This was unusual for her because she was not the kind to play pretend. She didn't even like playing with dolls. She was more of a computer geek so it was a little odd for her to have an imaginary friend. Normally, when a child invents an imaginary friend, it's because they want someone to play with. But her imaginary friend was super annoying. He was constantly bothering her. She was always complaining that Mikey wouldn't share a toy, or that he wouldn't play the game she wanted, 
or that he wasn't following the rules and taking turns. Who invents an imaginary friend that fights with them all day long? One day my mom was out front talking to the neighbor lady. She told mom that before the place was a crack house, there was a family living there that had kids, and she asked if we ever saw anything weird in the house. According to her, the family that lived there before us saw a little boy named Mikey in the house. This neighbor claimed her own son, who was now a teenager, used to play with Mikey too when he was younger and would visit the neighbors. She even said she saw Mikey herself on several occasions. That kind of freaked Mom out. My sister and I used to spend the weekends with our grandparents. While we were gone, Mom had to take the batteries out of all the toys because they would go off randomly when no one was in the room. For example, I had a piggy bank that made an oinky noise any time you put money in it. One night, it simply would not stop oinking. So Mom and Dad checked it out to see if it was jammed. But nothing was in it. I ended up having to throw it away because it just would not stop going off in the middle of the night, even when I was at home. Another thing, I never had sleeping problems before we moved into that house, nor did I have them after we left. But while we lived there, every morning I would wake up with my body contorted and shoved into the little space between the bed and the dresser, curled up in a tight little ball. I'd be so jammed in there that Mom had to pull me out every morning. We tried to figure out how it was happening, but we never could. And this never happened when I stayed at my grandparents' house. I was in the third or fourth grade at the time, and they had to put guardrails on my bed so I wouldn't fall out. But it didn't help. Every morning, I'd still be jammed in between the dresser and the bed. One night my mom was in the kitchen, and she had the feeling that somebody was watching her. When she turned around, she caught a glimpse of a little boy standing there. She said he looked about eight years old. He appeared for a second, and then he was gone. A few days after that, it was my sister's birthday. After the party, my sister and I spent the night at her grandparents' house. Mom and Dad were home alone. Mom took the helium-filled balloons from the party and tied them together and put them in the corner of the living room. Later that night they were watching TV, when suddenly the balloon strings gathered together like someone had grabbed them, and they were jerked down about a foot. Then they floated very slowly around the corner and down the back hallway. Once they got to the ceiling light in the hallway, the balloons dipped down and around the light and continued down the hall to my sister's bedroom door. My parents were watching in shock, not knowing what to do. But then my mom said out loud, Mikey, if you want the balloons, you can have them. As soon as she said that, the balloons disappeared into my sister's bedroom. After that, my mom looked into the history of the property. She found out that ours and three other houses on that block were built on property that used to belong to an old Catholic orphanage. One day, my sister said, It's Mikey's birthday. He wants us to make a cake for him. So my mom made a cake for him. She also made a note on what day it was that my sister claimed was Mikey's birthday to see if my sister would remember it the following year or if it was just something she made up. But sure enough, the entire time that we lived in that house, my sister would ask for a birthday cake for Mikey on the same day every year. One Christmas, Mom went out and bought Mikey a little toy horse. A couple of days later, the horse disappeared. My sister and I hadn't touched it and had no idea where it went. Two years later, we were playing outside, and we found the horse buried in the backyard. We took it inside, cleaned it off, and put it on the coffee table. That night, it went missing again, and we haven't seen it since. Three months ago, I was camping with a friend in a remote part of Northern California. I'm a massive wilderness junkie and I spend much of my free time hiking, rock climbing, fishing, and doing every sort of outdoor activity. 
My friend was heading up to the Sierras for the weekend, and he asked me to come along. We didn't stay at a campsite, but hiked about ten miles from our car to a clearing with a beautiful view. He'd been there before. On our second night there, we were sitting by the fire around 10 p.m. My friend got tired and went to the tent to go to sleep, but I wanted to stay up for a while. About 45 minutes after he went to bed, I saw something coming up from the valley below. It looked just like a UFO from a movie. It was saucer-shaped and had circular lights rotating all around the edges, and they were changing colors over and over again. I was absolutely shocked. I stared at it for maybe 15 seconds. Then I tried to wake up my friend so he could see it too, and prove to myself that I wasn't going crazy. I stood up and called out his name, and that's when everything started to get really messed up. I couldn't hear my own voice when I called out. Everything was completely silent. I could move my eyes, but I couldn't move my body. I remember looking at the fire, and it seemed frozen in place, like a snapshot. It was like time itself had stopped. Then there was a bright flash of light, and I blacked out. The next thing I remember, I woke up as the sun was rising. I was outside lying in the dirt, shivering next to a fire that had long died out. I felt like I'd been drugged. I was groggy and yelled out my friend's name a couple of times until he came out of the tent. He was really confused, to say the least, as I tried to explain what happened. But my memory was really foggy, and I couldn't articulate my thoughts well. But we were both freaked out enough that we packed up and left within 30 minutes. I was totally silent on the car ride home, falling in and out of a restless sleep for the entire seven-hour drive. My friend dropped me off at my house, and I basically passed out for the entire day. I tried to put the incident out of my mind. But a few weeks later, I was messing around with my stereo amp. It made a staticky noise when I unplugged my guitar. And for some reason, that sound triggered my memory, and everything that happened that night up in the Sierras came flooding back to me. That night I blacked out at around 10.45 p.m., standing by the fire. When I became conscious again, I was suspended inside a vertical circle in a strange room. My body was posed much like da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. There were shackles holding me in place, and they looked like they were made of clear glass. I was completely naked. Standing in front of me were three beings that looked like aliens. They were about four feet tall and wearing white spandex like suits. Two of them were just standing there observing, and the third was extracting blood from a vein under my armpit using a weird-looking syringe-type thing. Although they didn't show any emotion, I could tell they were really surprised that I was awake. I couldn't move at all except for my eyes and lips. It was absolutely terrifying. My heart was pounding from an influx of adrenaline. I can't even begin to tell you how scared I was but I also felt total rage. I wanted to kill them, to completely destroy them. My brain went primal, running on animal instinct alone. I could tell they sensed my anger because they all took a few steps back simultaneously. I'm six foot three and 185 pounds, and I was trying to look as threatening as possible, which was pretty silly because I was totally paralyzed and therefore completely harmless. At that point, two of them disappeared from my view and presumably left the room. The other one was just staring at me, devoid of any emotion at all. I wanted so badly to shut my eyes, but I forced myself to stare back at him, trying hard not to blink. Then the other two came back, but this time they weren't alone. I couldn't believe my eyes. Standing behind them were two very tall, very human-looking beings, a male and a female. They looked like Norse gods, with bright golden hair and massive eyes. The male's eyes were dark blue, and the females were violet. I suppose they're what the UFO community refers to as the Nordics. It was so bizarre. My family comes from Sweden, and I'm very Nordic-looking. 
blonde hair, blue eyes, light skin, the works. I know this is cliché, but I heard the female's voice in my mind. Somehow I could understand what she was saying, even though she wasn't using anything even close to English. She told me something like, Be calm. You're not in any danger. So I relaxed and asked her what they wanted with me. She said they were just checking up on me. I almost blacked out after hearing that. I asked her what she meant, and she said that they had saved my life when I first came into being. I immediately knew what she was talking about. I was born two months premature. My mother was horribly sick during the labor, and we both had fevers of 104 degrees. The strange thing is, though, the doctors had absolutely no idea what was wrong with us. I was given two spinal taps and my mother was given three. I spent four nights in the neonatal ICU, and there was a decent chance that I was going to die. But then one day, I just started getting better out of nowhere, and I made a full recovery. The doctors were very worried that the whole ordeal may have permanently damaged my body or my brain. But I was totally fine. I asked her, Why did you save me? But this time she didn't answer, the male did. I heard a deep voice say, This is a conversation for another time. I asked if they were human. He said no. I was confused because they looked so human. I asked if mankind was descended from them. He said yes, that they had come here 200,000 years ago and created mankind by combining their DNA with our primate ancestors. He also said that through the years, many males of his kind found female humans attractive and mated with them. So this directly passed on some of their physical features and traits to the Nordic people. I wanted to know more, but they declined to answer any further questions, and he said it was time for me to go back. When he said that, I blacked out instantly, and I woke up next to the extinguished campfire, once again wearing my clothes and shivering. I know this entire thing sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it happened. I don't know what to do. I've been completely lost and scared ever since the encounter. But I already feel a little bit better telling my story here. In 2016, my best friend and I were roommates in our first year of college. By the end of that year, we had come to the conclusion that our dorm room was haunted. It always felt like somebody was standing in the doorway watching us. Being alone in the room was the most terrifying because you never felt truly alone. We both saw a dark figure standing there from time to time too, just observing us. We also had very noisy upstairs neighbors. There would be constant thumping, footsteps, and knocking at all hours of the day and night. On many occasions, we went upstairs to complain to the guys who lived above us, but they were adamant that they hadn't been making any noise at all, going so far as to write us a note stating that they were sorry that we were being disturbed, but that they were in no way responsible for causing this nightly noise. One evening, when the banging and footsteps were particularly loud, we decided to go down a few floors to the cafeteria just to get away from the noise. When we arrived, we discovered the two guys living above us down there eating a late dinner, so it wasn't them making the noise. We felt really bad for having accused them all this time, but they were so nice about it. They even showed us their class schedules to prove that a lot of the times that we heard the noise they weren't even home. But by far, the scariest thing that happened to me that year was the horrifying nightmare that I had. In the dream, I was someone else, a man. I was standing in the doorway to our room, quietly observing, before I dropped down to my stomach and crawled across the room using my elbows, military style. I crawled over to my roommate's bedside and stood over her with this intense urge to kill her. In the dream, 
She sat up and screamed loudly, and it was so realistic that I woke up in a cold sweat. I remember lurching upright in bed and staring hard at my friend, who was still asleep, just to make sure she hadn't actually been screaming in terror. I couldn't sleep for two or three nights after that. I was so upset by the nightmare, I was afraid if I went to sleep, it would come again. I'm still traumatized by that dream today, remembering every single detail all these years later. Not long after that, we discovered that next door to our dormitory, literally next door, was the Chi Omega sorority house, the place where Ted Bundy brutally attacked four sorority girls, killing two of them back in 1978. Now, I'm not saying that Ted Bundy was haunting us, because that's a real stretch. But my friend and I do have a theory that the land is vulnerable to being a sort of portal for bad energy and spirits because of what happened there. When I was a child, I had a best friend named Anna, and her mother's name was Lana. Lana terrified me for some reason. She had such an ominous presence about her that it gave me nightmares. Anna and I were friends between the ages of 4 and 12. Around age 8, I was sleeping over at Anna's, and her mother brought a Ouija board out and said she was going to play with us. Being so young, we had no clue what a Ouija board even was, much less the danger it could bring. But that didn't faze her one bit. Lana decided to wait until it was completely dark outside before we'd play. When she deemed it was time, she got all dressed up in a long black cloak, lit some candles, and walked Anna, Anna's brother Greg, and me out to the woods behind the house at 11 p.m. at night. You know, just what any responsible adult would do with small children in her care. Their home was completely surrounded by woods on all sides, and I was terrified at that point, because I was already afraid of the dark, and being in the forest at night was an added bonus to freak me out. We sat in a circle on the grass in the woods, and Lana put frankincense and myrrh behind our ears. Where she got hold of those I'll never know. I was holding a rosary tightly in my hand. That detail sticks out in my mind. We began to play, I can't remember any of the questions that were asked, but that planchette absolutely did move around the board. Anna's brother Greg was sitting next to me. I remember both of our hands being on the planchette, and he looked up at me with absolute terror on his face, stunned that the planchette was actually moving. To this day, that experience still negatively impacts me. The nightmares I had about Lana have really stuck with me, and I've been haunted by them for so long. This happened 17 years ago, and I still feel uneasy as I type this. My friends and I are into urban exploration, and we went to check out an abandoned insane asylum one night not really expecting anything to happen. We broke in through one of the boarded-up windows. Once we were inside, we heard the sound of voices speaking very softly. We figured some other explorers had broken in too, so we followed the sounds of the voices to see who it was. As we were walking down the main hallway, we heard what sounded like a woman whispering, Why did you take my baby? Why did you take my baby? over and over again. At that point, I was so scared, I was shaking. The voices sounded like they were coming from a room to the left. But as we entered that room, we saw a huge cage. It looked like one of those pet carriers, but it was human size, and nobody was in the room. In fact, we looked all over that first floor, and nobody was there. I don't know what the hell was going on that night, and I don't really believe dead people were talking to us. But the sheer creepiness of it all was too much for me. I will not be going back. 
For a while, when I was young, my mother, sister, and I lived in a shelter for battered women and children. Due to a very ugly divorce and a messed up legal system in Alabama, my abusive father was given full custody of me and my sister. So in an effort to protect us, mom technically kidnapped us kids and went on the run, with my father in hot pursuit. We fled from Alabama to Washington State. One night in the shelter, I looked in the mirror and I saw a demon looking back at me. I screamed and ran to get my mom, but she assured me that there was nothing wrong. It was just my imagination. But that night, a kind-looking man that I can only describe as an angel appeared at the end of my bed. He was surrounded by a soft white light and stood there silently watching over me all night. But when I woke up in the morning, he was gone. But he appeared again the next night, and then the next and the next, silently watching over me, keeping me safe. He was there every night for the entire four months that we stayed in that shelter. He never spoke, he never moved, just stood guard. I told my mom about the angel man, and this time she believed me. Then one night he woke me up out of a deep sleep. I'll never forget how surprised I was, because he had never spoken before. He was calm and authoritative, but spoke with urgency. He said, He's coming. You have to get out now. I woke up Mom and told her what the angel man had said. I guess she thought it was better safe than sorry, because we packed up the car and went to a cheap motel for the night. The next day when we went back, we discovered that Dad had broken in that night and gone from room to room looking for us. But he left before the police came. We moved from that shelter not long after, and I never saw the angel man again. Mom never took us back to Alabama. We stayed in Washington, and she eventually won full custody of us both and a lifetime restraining order against my dad. Although, in Alabama, she's still wanted for kidnapping. But be that as it may, Thanks to Mom and our guardian angel, we're all still alive and safe. One day, I was running on the wooded trails of the Nathan Hale Homestead. It's an 18th century farmhouse, the property of a Revolutionary War hero in Connecticut. I was only going to run for 45 minutes, using my watch to keep time. I ran for a while, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. It was about 9 a.m. on a Monday morning. I was completely alone, with only the sounds of distant traffic from Route 31, the chirping birds, and the occasional deer that would scamper away whenever I came near, to keep me company. About 20 minutes in, I saw something strange 50 meters ahead of me a finely polished wooden coffin. I was a little weirded out, to say the least. I went in closer for a better look, but while running towards it, I had to round a corner with some old tree stumps blocking my view. When I got out from around them, the coffin had disappeared. Where I had just seen it moments before was now only a bunch of bushes. At that point, I decided to turn around and make my way back to the car. I was maybe half a mile away when I heard a very distinctive knocking on a nearby tree. It was to the rhythm of that old shaving a haircut two bits song. You know, da 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 da. Only it didn't have the two bits ending. It sounded like this. Not ten seconds later, there it was again, but this time on a completely different tree, up ahead of me somewhere. I picked up the pace, wanting to get back to the relative safety of my car as soon as possible. I was close enough now to see the entrance of the parking lot up ahead, but just as I saw it, once again, 
on a tree seemingly right next to me this time, I heard... I truly started to freak out now. I ran faster than I ever have to get back to my car. It was at that point when time seemed to slow down. All of a sudden, the temperature dropped about 20 degrees, the birds stopped singing, and my watch malfunctioned. It was making all kinds of beeping noises, and the numbers on the display panel were glitching out on the screen. Right then, I heard it again, but this time it was impossibly loud. It sounded like it was coming from every tree in the surrounding area. An overwhelming sense of dread washed over me as I anticipated hearing the two bits part of the refrain, or perhaps worse than hearing it, seeing what was causing it. As I ran into the parking lot, I looked down at my watch. It was flashing 12 p.m. noon, January 1st. My watch had reset itself. It had never done that before. I grabbed my keys, got into the car, and started the engine. As soon as the engine turned on, the clock on the car radio said 12 noon. That couldn't be right. It should have only been 9.45 a.m. at the latest. I threw the car in reverse and backed out of the parking spot. But just as I was about to throw the car into drive and pull away, that's when I heard it. The final part of the couplet that was missing throughout the ordeal. There was a sharp rap at the back window, like someone hit it with their knuckles. The two bits part of the refrain. There was no one else in the parking lot. No cars, no people, no animals, no anything. I was completely alone. So what was rapping on the window? Well, I didn't look behind me. I just hightailed it out of there and back to my house. I have no idea what could have caused that series of events, and I still can't explain it to this day. I used to be in the military, and the training camp barracks where we lived was haunted. It started out innocently. Our stuff would disappear, then reappear in weird places, like the shower or inside a bag that we had zipped up and put away. At first we figured it was no big deal. It could have been human error, or maybe someone playing a prank. But what came next freaked everyone out. One night after lights out, when we were supposed to put everything away and go to sleep, my friend was on his phone texting his girlfriend. Suddenly, he heard footsteps coming from the hallway. Thinking it was our sergeant, he quickly hid the phone under his pillow, rolled over, and pretended to be asleep. He heard someone come up behind him, and then a soft voice say, Go ahead. Pretend you're asleep. I don't mind. There was no one there. Now normally I would dismiss this as a figment of his imagination, if not for the fact that five other people around him heard it as well including me. Creepier still, it was the voice of a little girl that said it. Now our training camp is in the middle of an island and it's been closed to everyone but military personnel for the past 15 years. So there were no civilians around, let alone children. To make things even freakier, when we came back from our weekend leave, there was a bunch of long black female hair on his bed neatly bundled up, and underneath his pillow was a note that said, Remember me? And it was in a child's handwriting. When I was a rookie cop, my brother committed suicide. My brother and I were very close and I had a lot of guilt for not recognizing the signs and getting him the help that he needed. By the time his body was discovered, he'd begun to decompose, so we had a closed coffin service. About a week after he died, I was on the job one night. 
My partner and I saw a pimp beating and pistol whipping one of his girls. I jumped out of the car, and the pimp saw me and took off running. I ran after him, gun in hand. He cut through an alleyway at the back of a building that led to a courtyard. Right before I reached the courtyard, I heard my dead brother's voice in my head say, It's okay. You're safe. As I hit the courtyard, the guy came out from behind a wall, pointed his gun at my head, and pulled the trigger. Twice. I froze for a second, realized I was still alive, and started beating him in the head with my revolver. To this day, I don't know why I didn't pull the trigger, but I'm very glad I didn't. After he was subdued, I cuffed him and walked him back to the car. I told my partner about him squeezing off two rounds and the gun not going off, but not about the voice I heard. We unloaded his gun, a thirty-two revolver, right there. We found that two of the bullets in the chamber had strike marks on them. That's not supposed to happen. After returning to the station, we had the gun tested right away, because if the gun were inoperable, for, say, a defective firing pin or bad ammunition... They wouldn't charge him with attempted murder, just menacing in the second degree. I told the lab guy the story of what happened. He examined the two bullets, saw the strike marks on them, put them back in the gun, then shot them into a water tank to see if they would fire. Both bullets fired. The pimp took a plea deal for attempted manslaughter and criminal possession of a weapon. He got 12 years. I told my family the story, but I told my mother first. She was so devastated over losing her son, I wanted to share the story with her and maybe make her feel better. I said, Maybe my brother knows what he did was so painful for everyone to bear that by saving me, he was trying to atone for it, and also to let us know that he's not really gone, but he's here looking out for us. She did feel better. At least, that day. I used to be a police officer in the UK. As a brand new recruit at the age of 19, I hadn't been on the job very long, when one day I was patrolling on foot, walking past a group of shops just getting to know the area. It was a quiet evening in September with just a few people around. My intention was to keep walking down the street, but for some reason I turned around and went back to the shops. And just as I did, there was a radio call to one of the cars to attend an incident in that same location where I was. I radioed in to say that I was already on the scene, so was given permission to go ahead and see what was happening. It turned out that an older man had collapsed in the car park after leaving a restaurant. The staff had called an ambulance and the police. The man's wife had been waiting in the car for him, so she was on the scene too. I got to him within seconds, and it was evident that the man needed an ambulance urgently. He was unconscious, and he had saliva spewing from his mouth in a constant stream, and his poor wife was trying to mop it up with tissues. His wife was nearly hysterical. I still don't know what caused it, presumably a stroke. The ambulance was very quick to respond. As the paramedics strapped him into the stretcher and loaded him onto the ambulance, I was standing at the back door, waiting to help his wife climb inside so she could ride along. No one but me saw what happened next. I saw that man sit up. He sat up straight and he didn't have any straps on him any longer. He looked at his wife standing next to me and raised his hand to wave at her, but she didn't notice or acknowledge the wave at all. All of this happened in a matter of seconds. I blinked, looked back, and he was lying down on the stretcher again, unconscious and strapped in. He hadn't moved, but I'd just seen him sit up. One of the paramedics looked at me and shook his head, indicating that the man had died. His wife was not aware of that at the time. I helped her into the back of the ambulance and then made out my report, but I obviously left out the part about the vision I had of his waving goodbye to his wife. 
I never told anyone what I saw. During my sophomore year at college, my mother and sister Fern decided to rent a small cottage off campus to be near me. It came fully furnished because the lady who had lived there before them had just walked out one day, breaking the lease and leaving all of her belongings behind. My sister and I were hanging out one day, and she mentioned that she and Mom were having some crazy dreams, and that the mattresses in the cottage all had reddish-brown stains on them, so they threw them in a room in the basement and bought new ones. She showed me a picture of the mattresses. Uh, Fern? That looks like blood on the mattresses. A lot of blood. What is that? She said, Well, it really doesn't matter. We have new ones now. Anyway, they invited me to stay in the guest room for a few days at the end of term, since we'd all be driving back to New York together after school ended. The house was a little unsettling, but fine. Until I asked to do some laundry. I asked my sister where the washing machine was. She said, Oh, it's in the basement. I'll show you. She opened the basement door, and her dog started growling. She told the dog to be quiet, and told me to follow her down the stairs. The moment my foot touched those stairs, I felt nauseous. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and my hands went clammy. There was this feeling that something menacing was looming down there. The basement was completely unfinished. It was just concrete floors and old pipes. Fern pointed to a rusty metal door off to the right. That's where we put the bloody mattresses. There's a pool table in there, too. Want to see? For some reason, Fern didn't seem to feel the same things I was feeling. She went over and casually opened up the door. I could see inside from three feet away, and there was no way in hell I was getting any closer. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I recognized the pile of bloody, dirty mattresses stacked up in front of an old pool table. Fern told me that there were two more doors in that room, but they were locked and they weren't given a key by the landlord, so she has no idea what's behind them. I was literally shaking at that point and the dog was still upstairs, whining and growling. Trying to hide my nerves, I told Vern to just close the door and show me where the laundry room was. She closed the door and pointed me to a different door, opened it up, and pulled the string to turn on the single, bare light bulb that was hanging from the ceiling. Inside was an old washer and dryer, with a long metal table between them. Upon closer inspection... There was a rusty red smear that went from the top of the washer all the way down to the end of the table. The rest of the room was filled with junk, cardboard boxes, sheet metal, and broken furniture. The single bulb did not even come close to illuminating the entire room, so it was like standing in a spotlight. The feeling of being watched was nearly unbearable, like a low, heavy ache in my chest but my sister seemed totally oblivious to everything. I said something about needing to go upstairs and get my dirty clothes, but Fern said, Oh, it's okay. Wait here. I'll get them for you. And then she ran off. Not wanting to be down there alone, I tried to follow her. But before I could, I felt a hand grab my shoulder from behind. I spun around, ready to punch the crap out of whatever had just touched me but there was nothing there. That's when I heard a low, sarcastic voice say, Welcome. Three inches from my face. I just about wet myself. I flew out of that room and up the stairs, screaming bloody murder. When I got to the living room, my sister and mom asked me what was wrong embarrassed, and not wanting to tell them that I thought I heard a ghost, I told them I saw a millipede. Neither one of them seemed to feel anything out of the ordinary in the house, and I didn't want them to think I was crazy. 
I didn't do laundry that night or any night until we got back to New York. I don't regret it either. Having dirty clothes was a small price to pay to avoid whatever was in that basement. When I was in high school, my friend's parents went out of town, so we had a few of us over. This story happened well before we started drinking, so I was 100% sober. After a long day of just messing around and doing guy stuff, I got tired and decided to go inside and upstairs to their family room to take a nap. His parents were really big on traveling, and they collected artifacts from every place they'd ever been. The coolest things in that room were the African masks and statues. They were all facing in different directions. Anyway, I went to sleep on the couch, and I had just barely closed my eyes when I heard someone walking up the stairs. A second later, they entered the room I was in, so I opened my eyes to see who it was. Not only was no one there, but the sound of the footsteps kept advancing towards me. They never stopped, and when I looked down, I could actually see the floorboards moving along with the footsteps. I jumped up and turned to run, and that's when I saw that every single African mask and statue had turned on their own and were now all staring straight at me. I sprinted down the stairs and outside, and I tried to explain to the guys what happened, but they all just laughed at me. Of course, when we all went back upstairs, everything looked normal again but I have goosebumps just writing about this. It was the scariest experience of my life, hands down. Two years ago, my parents went out for the night and I was home alone. At one point, I heard the sound of shattering glass coming from the basement. I went down to see what was going on and found the wine glass collection that was over the bar had been smashed against the bar wall. All 30 of them. Nobody was in the house and all the windows and doors were locked and I had the only key. It was weird considering the fact that they were hanging from the ceiling above the bar a good 20 feet across the room from the wall they smashed against. How that happened I'll never know. When my mom and dad got home, they didn't believe me when I told them what happened. They thought I did it, so they grounded me. I still get yelled at today when the subject comes up. So screw you, ghost. During college, I lived on campus. The dorm room doors only locked from the inside, and the hallway lights were on a motion sensor after 10 p.m. to save power, so the hallway would be dark unless someone were walking down it. It was past midnight, and my roommate and I were in our dorm with the door locked. I was sitting at my desk working on my laptop, using only the computer screen for light because he was trying to get some sleep. I closed my eyes for what I perceived to be only a second, but when I opened them again, the computer screensaver was on, so everything was dark. It was set to do that if the computer had been idle for at least 15 minutes. In the dark, I heard my roommate thrashing around in bed and gasping for air. I called out to him and said, Hey Mark, are you okay? As soon as I said it, I heard him gasp like he had just come up for air out of a swimming pool. At that same moment, my hand bumped the mouse, and the computer screen light came on. Then our door flew open and slammed against the wall. It had been locked from the inside, and we heard footsteps running down the hall. I ran over to see who it was, and although I still heard the footsteps, no one was out there, and the hall lights were still off. Nothing had tripped the motion sensors. The hall lights only came on when I stuck my head out the door to see who it was, and yet, no one was there. When I stepped back into the room, a very angry Mark asked me why I thought it would be funny to hold a pillow over his face and try to suffocate him. I assured him I had done nothing of the sort. Then I told him what actually happened. The next day, 
we asked to be transferred to another room. Have you ever felt the vibration of a subway train as it passes by you in the station? You know, that low chest rattling buzz? As a young kid, I was taking the trash out during a big ice storm and I felt that vibration in my bones. As I walked down to the end of the driveway with my trash can in tow, that buzzing feeling got stronger and stronger. As I got to the end of the driveway, I saw from across the street a pale barefoot little girl wearing nothing but a sundress. She had her back to me. Remember, this was during an ice storm. At that moment, there was no sound at all. No wind, no street noise, nothing. Clearly, something out of the ordinary was happening. My legs turned to jello, and my hands were shaking. When I tried to call out to the little girl to ask if she was okay, I found I couldn't speak at all. I could form the words, but they died before they could leave my mouth. Then the little girl turned around and I saw her face was made up only of what seemed to be white static. Kind of like what you see on a TV station that isn't coming in right. I ran back up to the house so fast, I slipped on the ice and skidded the last few feet to the front door. I've never seen her again, thank God. But sometimes I can still hear and feel that buzzing when I pull into the driveway. And when that happens, I always run inside as fast as I can. I had a boyfriend who died in high school, and I would visit his grave late at night. It always comforted me to talk to him. One evening, around 11 p.m., I spent about 10 minutes by his grave. Then I walked through the cemetery back to my car. Halfway back, I passed an old black man who looked to be about 80 years old. He was sitting on a bench with his legs crossed, smoking a cigarette, and he wore a big Panama hat. I nodded my head to say hello, but he just kept smoking his cigarette while staring me down. So I kept walking. I'd only walked a few steps past him when this thought hit me. Why is there an old man sitting in a cemetery all alone this late at night? I turned around to ask him, but there was no one there. I looked around, and there was no one anywhere in sight. All of a sudden, I felt the presence of evil, so I got back to my car as fast as I could, and I've stopped visiting the graveyard at night. As I was heading up to bed one night, I heard my partner walking on the stairs behind me. At the top of the stairs, I went straight into the bedroom, while she turned into the hallway bathroom. I didn't turn the light on in the bedroom, so the only way I could see was with the ambient light coming from the bathroom. As I was trying to plug in my cell phone to be charged, she closed the bedroom door so it got really dark. I yelled, Hey, open the door! I can't see anything in here! Just then the bedroom lights came on, so I figured she turned them on. There's a switch in the hallway right outside the door. So I called out my thanks to her, plugged in my cell phone, and got in bed. Fifteen minutes went by, and I realized she'd been in the bathroom for quite a while, and I hadn't heard her flush the toilet or walk out, so I checked to see if she was okay. I opened the bathroom door, and it was empty. I called out to her, and she answered me from downstairs. Confused, I went down to ask her if she had just been in the bathroom, but she said she hadn't been upstairs at all. So, who was that upstairs with me? Two weeks later, something similar happened to her. She was in the bedroom with the door closed. Suddenly, she heard a voice outside the door calling our cat's name. She opened the door and the cat was sitting there, but there was no one else in the house. We still can't explain either incident.
When I was 10, my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer. Shortly after that, my parents moved her in with us so they could help take care of her. The guest room became her room. Over the next year or so, her health declined, and it was clear that she was going to die soon. She eventually did die in the guest bedroom, surrounded by all of her family. After she died, Mom and Dad moved me into that room because it was bigger. But I always had a weird feeling when I was in that room. It was almost as if I was being watched. It really creeped me out. Weird things started to happen, things that I can't explain to this day. First of all, I was sitting on the floor in front of my TV playing Nintendo, when out of the blue, the tempered glass doors on my TV stand randomly shattered into hundreds of pieces. I was nowhere near it, and there was nothing I can think of to have caused it. A few months later, I was in bed. It was pretty late, and I heard some weird scratching noises coming from inside my closet. My closet was huge. It had four sliding doors and ran the length of the wall, and there was a section of it that still held some of my grandmother's belongings. I ran to get my dad because I was scared. He came in the room, looked around in the closet, and didn't see anything, so he told me to go to sleep. He was just leaving the room when out of nowhere, two of the closet doors slid completely open on their own. I don't know how to explain it, and trust me, I've tried. For the rest of my childhood, I refused to sleep in that bedroom, and I ended up making the living room couch my new bed. On a windy New England fall evening, my brother and I were at home alone, he was in middle school and I was in my sophomore year of high school. As was normally the case, whenever the wind was strong, the power went out. So he and I were sitting in the kitchen with a flashlight, talking about the stupid stuff that teenage boys talk about. Without warning, we heard something very heavy fall upstairs. It kind of sounded like a bookcase tipping over. At first I thought a tree fell on the roof. But when we heard the sound of something very heavy being slowly dragged across the entire length of the upstairs, I knew it wasn't a tree. The whole time my brother and I were completely silent, listening to whatever it was moving across the floor. We fixed our eyes on the ceiling where the sound was coming from, and our gaze followed the sound as it moved. Once it reached the other side of the house, the sound stopped. My brother and I sat there for a moment looking at one another. Eventually, I broke the silence and said, Uh, go upstairs and see what that was. He replied, Uh, no. So I said, Okay, I guess we'll have to go up together. We both slowly headed upstairs and looked around through every room, but we found nothing. Everything was still in place. So I convinced myself that it really must have been a tree that fell on the roof, even though I was pretty sure that sound came from inside the house and on the floor, not the roof. As we were heading back downstairs, in one of the rooms I noticed there was a bunch of leaves on the floor, and they looked like they'd blown in through the window. But when I checked the window, it was closed and locked. I quickly told my brother to check all the windows in the other rooms to see if they were locked too. We ran around checking all of the remaining windows, but all were closed and locked. I asked him if he knew how those leaves got on the floor, but he said he didn't. The way our house is set up, there's no way that anyone could have come in or gone out without passing us when we were sitting in the kitchen, and no one could have escaped out the upstairs windows because they were locked and you can't lock them from the outside. And I highly doubt anyone could have slipped past us when we were searching the upstairs. It's just too small. We would have seen them. Thoroughly scared, my brother and I sat outside in the cold darkness, waiting for either the power to come on 
or our parents to come home before we would go back inside. Luckily, the lights came on, so we hid in the basement and distracted ourselves by playing video games until our parents came home. The next day, I looked around outside the house, trying to find out what fell on the roof, but there was nothing to be found. We never did tell our parents, and all these years later, the memory still scares me. About two years ago, I moved in with my best friend and his girlfriend. The house used to belong to the girlfriend's grandmother, and she left it to her in her will. It was a really big house with three bedrooms and a bathroom upstairs, and a bathroom downstairs. They decided they wanted a bigger bedroom, so they made the dining room into the living room, and the living room into one big bedroom. When I moved in, I took one of the upstairs rooms. The upstairs was genuinely creepy. I always felt like I was going to wake up and see a ghost. While I never did see a ghost, something terrifying did happen. One night, my girlfriend stayed over. We rented a few movies and hung out, and when we went to sleep, everything was fine. But in the morning when we went downstairs, I found my two roommates really irritated with us. They told us we were way too loud the previous night, and we kept waking them up. Well, my girlfriend and I had no idea what they were talking about, so we asked him what they heard. He said his girlfriend woke up hearing really loud slapping sounds. She got scared thinking that I was hitting my girlfriend, so she woke him up, and they both listened. A few minutes went by, and they heard nothing, so they both went back to sleep. But as soon as they started drifting off, they were both jolted back awake by a really loud thud coming from upstairs. They said it sounded like somebody had stomped with both feet on the floor right above them. Now they assume that my girlfriend and I were having some kind of crazy sex or something. A few hours later, they were both woken up again to the sound of somebody sprinting up and down the hallway upstairs. Pissed off, my friend walked to the bottom of the stairs and shouted, What are you guys doing up there? It's four in the morning! The sound stopped immediately. He stood there staring up into the darkness, waiting for a reply that never came. Then he heard someone singing. He thought it was one of us, of course, and he told us to shut up and go to bed. Then he went back into his own room. As soon as he got back into bed, he heard someone humming at the top of the stairs, and that continued on until morning light. The two of them thought that we were trying to scare them or something, but we were asleep the entire night, and we heard none of what they were describing. That really creeped me out, because I had to sleep up there every night. My best friend from high school lived in a notoriously haunted house. Everyone at school knew about it. Apparently, it used to belong to her uncle, and the room that's now her sister's bedroom was used for Satan worship. There were all kinds of symbols on the walls and ceiling when they moved in, but her parents just painted over them. I don't think they even bothered to get the house blessed. One night I was staying over at her house after homecoming. We were up late just messing around, trying to scare each other and making fun of the whole haunted house thing. She asked me to go with her to the bathroom down the hall. She was afraid to go alone, because everyone in the house was sleeping and the rest of the house was pitch black. I said no, because I was scared too. Okay, fine. I'll go alone. But when she opened the bedroom door... I saw the silhouette of a very tall man standing behind her, in the kitchen. I could tell it wasn't anyone from her family, because none of them were that tall. I didn't know what to do. I was terrified, so I covered my eyes. She asked me what was wrong, and when I looked up, there was no one in the kitchen. 
the silhouette wasn't there anymore. I told her what I saw and said I would come to the bathroom with her because I didn't want either of us to be alone after that. She argued that it may have been her dad, but there was no way it could have been her dad. That thing was far too tall. Besides, her dad was asleep in his room. Also, why would her father stand there in the pitch black kitchen? It made no sense. Something else happened that night, too. I got a few phone calls from a restricted phone number on my cell, and when I'd pick up, a strange voice would be on the other end saying, I can see you. Over and over again. That was the last time I spent the night at her house. This happened back in 2018, when I was a nursing student doing my practicum. I was paired with a mentor, working the night shift in a hospital ward. It was midnight, and we were doing rounds, and I discovered that an elderly patient had died sometime in the night. My mentor called the doctor, then showed me the hospital protocol of bagging the body so it could be transferred to the morgue. We had to do it ourselves because there was very few staff working on the overnight shift. It was my first experience with a dead body as a nursing student, so I was very eager to make a good impression on my mentor and learn what to do. We had a porter come up with a stretcher and a body bag. The three of us put the man inside the bag, then transferred him from his bed to the stretcher. As we finished moving the body bag onto the stretcher, I turned around, and I will never forget what I saw. A large black mass was barreling towards me, fast. It came right up to my face, then disappeared. The most bizarre part was that I actually felt air from the mass coming towards me. It's the same feeling you get when someone runs past you and you feel that rush of air hit your face. No one else saw it, and I sure didn't tell them either. But I kept thinking about it when we went down to the morgue together with the body. I clearly felt and saw something that night, and I've never spoken about it before, until now. I was 16 when this happened. Mom and I were staying at my older sister's house. We were staying in the bedroom in the newly renovated basement. My mom, sister, and her kids were all upstairs eating breakfast, while I was downstairs having a shower in the basement bathroom, right next to our bedroom. Everything was fine, until I got out and was drying myself off. The light started to flicker. At first I didn't think anything of it. I wrapped the towel around myself and went to open the door, but it wouldn't open. I thought maybe I had locked the door and just forgot, though I was sure I hadn't. I turned the lock and tried again, but it still wouldn't open. It was then that the light started to flicker even more rapidly, as if someone were quickly hitting the light switch on and off. I got scared and desperately tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge no matter what I did. I was pushing and pulling the unlocked door, but it wouldn't open. The lights started to go on and off even faster. They were like strobe lights at that point. I yelled for help and my mom came running down the stairs. As soon as she got within 10 feet of the door, the lights went back to normal and the door opened up with no problem. All of us tried to replicate the issue with the door, but we couldn't. There was no problem with the lock on the door now. They thought the whole thing was hilarious. My sister said it was probably the steam making the lights flicker. But that doesn't explain why a door wouldn't open, no matter which way I turned the lock. But as soon as somebody else could see the door, it opened with no problem. Now when I visit my sister... I stay upstairs. I work in the mental health field, 
and part of my job used to be supervising intern psychologists. One Friday years ago, I was at the end of my shift, and I got a call from one of the interns telling me that one of her patients walked in without an appointment. She said he was acting strangely, and she was afraid he was becoming psychotic and may need to be hospitalized. She asked me to meet with him and then discuss his condition with her. So I called my own boss, just in case we needed backup, and I told my intern to bring her patient to my boss's office and we could all meet together. The patient walked in pushing a toy baby stroller with a baby doll strapped in it. The patient was a six-foot-two, middle-aged black man, so needless to say I could understand why the intern was a little concerned. We invited him to sit down, and we all settled in for a nice chat. I turned to the patient, exchanged a few pleasantries, then said, Can you tell me why you've brought Shaniqua with you here today? and pointed towards the doll. The guy's face fell. He asked me where I got that name. I said, Well, you must have just told it to me. He said, No, I didn't. I then turned to my intern and said, Well, then she must have told me the name. But my intern said, I've never heard that name before in my life. I turned back to the patient and he took a deep breath and sighed. He then went on to explain that he had a daughter years ago, and she died in infancy. Her name was Shaniqua. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. We decided not to hospitalize the man, and we all went home. The next day, when I spoke to the intern, she said she reviewed all of her notes, and the patient had never mentioned that name nor had he even revealed that he had a daughter who died until the previous night. It still gives me chills to this day. I was hanging out in the dorms with my college friend. The walls were thin and you could hear people in the other rooms. We were watching a movie, and the guy in the next room had his TV on louder than usual. Eventually, we got mad, knocked on the wall, and asked him to turn it down. The volume went down for about three seconds. Then, it turned up even louder than before. We thought he was being a dick, and we banged on the wall again, yelling for him to turn it down. But the volume went up even louder again when we did that. Now we were mad, so we went into the hallway to knock on his door and confront him. As we were standing in front of his door, we saw the guy that lived in the room walking towards us down the hall from the elevator. The second we saw him, the TV in his room went off completely and fell silent. Thoroughly confused, we asked him if he had someone staying in his room. He said no. We told him what was going on, and he unlocked the door. We were prepared to fight whoever had broken into his room. No one was inside, but we found all of his desk drawers and the closet door wide open. Now this was on the fourth floor, so nobody could have escaped out the window, and all three of us were standing in the hallway by the door, and no one had left the room. We all slept in the common room that night, with the lights on. When I was young, I was visiting my grandparents in New York. They had me sleep in a bedroom that had four dolls, one in each corner, facing towards the center of the room. Now, I'm afraid of dolls. I don't know why, but I've never liked them. They always scared me. So I turned all four of the dolls around to face the wall so they weren't staring at me. I woke up thirsty in the night and went downstairs to get a glass of water. Halfway down the stairs, I heard a creaking sound. Walking a few steps further down the stairs, I saw a rocking chair going back and forth with no one in it. It was a constant movement, too, not a slowing down as if someone had just gotten up. It kept going back and forth as if someone were rocking in it. 
I decided I really didn't need that glass of water after all and ran back upstairs into my room, only to find all four of the dolls were turned around again and were now facing the center of the room and me. I grabbed the blankets off my bed, ran into the bathroom, and spent the night in the tub. A friend of mine worked the graveyard shift, doing security for the Terrell Insane Asylum in East Texas. His stories about that place are legendary, and this is one of my favorites. It happened shortly after he took the job. The asylum is on a campus and consists of quite a few buildings. While driving through the campus on the overnight shift, he approached one of the original and oldest buildings on the property. The building had long since been retired as a hospital ward and was being used only for storage of old medical equipment. He noticed a light was on in one of the upper rooms and figured it must have been carelessly left on by one of the staff earlier in the day while they were storing some equipment. He entered the building, walked up the four flights, and saw the light at the end of the hall. As he walked down the hallway towards the room, he did the usual security protocol of jiggling the handles of all the doors that he passed to make sure they were locked. He finally reached the room, entered it, and saw nothing out of place. So he flipped the light off, shut the door, and locked it. But when he turned around to walk back down the long hallway, he froze. Every door that he had just made sure were locked and secured were now standing wide open. No lights were on, and everything was silent, but all of the doors were wide open. Well, he noped it out of there as fast as he could, and once he was outside and back in the security van, he turned around to see that the fourth floor light was on once again. When my wife and I first got married, we moved in with her grandmother to help take care of her after her husband died. She was diabetic and had already lost one leg to amputation and needed a walker to get around. Our bedroom was on one side of the hallway bathroom and her grandmother's was on the other side. One night we were lying in bed and we heard her grandmother's door open, then the sound of somebody walking to the bathroom but it sounded like they were walking on two legs, no walker. Her walker made a very distinct sound on the hardwood floors, and we hadn't heard it. But we did hear the sound of somebody walking on two feet. The bathroom light went on, and I could see a shadow of two legs under the door. But there was no sound, no running water, no moving around, no toilet flushing. Then the light clicked off, and I heard the door open again. But no one was there when we looked, and her grandmother was in bed, asleep. Another time in that house, our nine-month-old child was in his crib, going down for a nap. My wife put a wind-up musical toy clown in the crib with him, because he liked the soothing music. Then she went out to the kitchen with the baby monitor, so she could hear him as she worked. As soon as she got to the kitchen, the music stopped, and she heard our son cooing like he was interacting with someone. My wife went in to make sure that everything was okay, and when she walked in, she found the clown standing up on the dresser on the other side of the room, as if someone took it out of his crib and placed it there. But no one else was at home. We spoke to our other family members about this, and most of them had stories to tell. All of this seemed to have started after my wife's grandfather died. One story involved a musical Christmas ornament that her grandfather hated. He would always turn the volume way down, and her grandmother would go and turn it right back up again. It was a constant battle between the two of them. After his death, her grandmother had that ornament on the tree, turned up loud as usual. She was in the kitchen when the sound got quieter. She went to see if the batteries were dead, but they were working just fine. That whole night, she turned the volume up 
and as soon as she got back into the kitchen, the volume went down again, just like Grandpa used to do. Here's a final story. One of Grandma's daughters picked her up to take her out to lunch. When they returned home, there was a bowl in the kitchen strainer that had obviously just been washed and left to dry, and the entire house smelled like chili, which was her grandfather's favorite meal. No one was home, and no one had cooked any chili. I think Grandpa's still around. When I was 19, I was in a very emotionally abusive relationship with a girlfriend that I lived with. She isolated me by basically forcing me to cut ties with all my family and friends. Then, she systematically drove my self-esteem into the ground. On Halloween night in 2010, around 11 p.m., I came very close to committing suicide because of it all. The only thing that stopped me was that I couldn't find the shotgun shells. It wasn't until months later, after leaving her and reconciling with my parents, that I heard this story. On Halloween that year, both of my parents randomly woke up at 11 p.m. and had a strong feeling that something was terribly wrong with me. So they went downstairs to my old bedroom to pray for me. But when they entered the room, they both felt a dark, heavy presence inside. They both said that it felt malicious. It was so strong that my mom couldn't even stay in the room, so my dad went in alone, and he prayed for my well-being for over an hour until the dark presence left. I had entertained suicidal thoughts for over an hour that night, until the thoughts just left me. It seems that, somehow, my parents' connection to me was so strong that they were able to help me forget about killing myself, even from 50 miles away. I can't explain it, and I don't think I really need to. In high school, I met a friend that ended up coming down with leukemia. It ravaged his body, and was a terrible thing to witness. One night around 10 p.m., I got a call from his mother to please come over. She said she thought he may die that night. I was only 16 years old, and I had no experience of having someone close to me die. But I really wanted to be there to comfort my friend, so I went. It was really hard seeing him that way. He had wasted away to only 75 pounds, couldn't talk, and was full of painkillers. He looked helpless. I stayed in his room talking to him, trying to make him laugh, but I couldn't. It was the most brutal and heartbreaking thing that I've ever seen, and I can't even imagine what he was going through. That night when I went home, I had the most vivid dream I've ever had in my life. I was in front of our old high school in Florida, and it looked like it had just been through a hurricane. There were trees uprooted, houses were destroyed, and there was debris strewn everywhere on the street. But the sky was blue, and the sun was beautiful and shining. It was the calm after the storm. I walked through all of the destruction, and I ended up at the local convenience store, where all us kids hang out after school. There I saw my friend, sitting on the curb in front of the store. I was stunned because he didn't look sick at all. In fact, he looked the picture of health. I said, Sean, what are you doing here? He smiled brightly and said, I just wanted to tell you I'm okay. Everything's fine. I'm happy. I was so confused. How is it that you got better so fast? Sean said nothing. He just sat there smiling and turned his face to the sun. When I woke up the next morning, that dream was still in my mind. I went to the kitchen and I saw my mom. She told me that about an hour after I left Sean the previous night, he passed away. 
I feel he came to me in that dream, letting me know he was okay to put my mind at ease. He was trying to make me feel better, just as I tried to do for him before he died. I believe the debris from the hurricane and the calm after the storm was a metaphor for what he went through down here and where he is now. It was a very comforting dream, but I still miss him a lot. About five or six years ago, I was on a business trip to Tennessee. I was driving in, and I was still about an hour away from my destination. It was late, and I was exhausted, so I found a roadside hotel and pulled in. I intended to spend the night, get some sleep, and start fresh in the morning. I went inside and asked if there was an available room. The owner said, Yes, of course. It's just me the hotel manager, and all the ghosts here. The place is pretty haunted, but they're nice ghosts. I was a little taken aback, but I was exhausted, so I said, Uh, okay, they're nice. No weird stuff, right? To which he responded, Well, stuff will happen, but most likely nothing bad. I was so tired, I just said, Whatever, give me a room. To be fair, the place actually looked pretty cool from the outside. It's a really old building, and it was right next to the train tracks. I love the architecture of old buildings, so I was fine with it. The owner showed me up to the second floor, where my room was located. As soon as I set foot up there, though, I got this sinking feeling, like this was a really bad idea and I should just leave. But I was exhausted and not fit to drive so I continued on. The hallway itself was like something straight out of a horror movie. It seemed to go on without end. The hallway actually seemed longer than the building, if that makes any sense. It was creepy as hell. The owner then introduced me to the hotel manager, who just happened to be up on the floor. He told me she'd be the only other person staying in the hotel that night, since he stays in another building. He joked that there were just too many ghosts in this building for his taste, and then said goodnight. Okay, whatever. My room was pretty standard, nothing special. It was facing the front of the hotel with a window overlooking the train tracks. But I really didn't care what the room looked like. I was so tired that within minutes of lying down, I was out cold. I have no idea how much time passed, but suddenly, the sound of a train woke me up, and I realized that I was completely paralyzed. Something was holding me down. I was pinned to the bed so tight, I couldn't move. It was horrifying. I was trying so hard to move and fight this thing off of me, but I could barely do anything. After about ten minutes or so, when I finally gave up fighting and went limp, the thing let go. I jumped up out of bed freaking out, wondering what the hell just happened. By that time it was past midnight, so I decided to just sit in a chair, turn on the TV and stay up all night. Forget about sleeping. After about an hour, I heard another train go by. And as it did, right outside my door, I heard the sound of glasses clanking loudly, like someone was carrying a tray of glasses down the hall but only from my door to where the headboard of my bed was. Back and forth, back and forth, again and again, clank, 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 right outside my door. This went on for about a minute straight, then I went and opened the door, and as soon as I opened the door, everything went silent. An unnatural silence. No one was out there. I went back and sat down on the chair and thought, Okay, what's going to happen next? Before I could even finish that thought, the TV picture started getting all weird and wavy. It was now around 6 a.m., and I was still sitting in that chair, wide awake. Just then, I heard the disembodied voice of a little girl say right in my ear, There's somebody in the chair. 
I looked up, and there was a shadow figure of a really tall man wearing a hat, rising up out of the other chair across the room. I blinked, opened my eyes, and he was gone. Well, that was it. I grabbed my stuff, packed it up, and left as fast as I could. I went down to the lobby, freaking out. The owner was there, starting his workday, and he asked me what was wrong. I told him what happened, and he calmly replied, Oh yeah, a little girl died in your room. She fell out of the window while waiting for her daddy to come home on the train. I looked at him and said, Why, out of all the empty rooms in the entire place, would you put me in that room? He looked at me and said, Well, it has the best view. Now mind you, I arrived after dark and let him know I was leaving first thing in the morning, and the view from the window was of the train tracks. Awesome hospitality, not so awesome intelligence. So I started ranting, telling him that all this talk about nice ghosts was a bunch of crap. They may not have hurt me, but my God, did they scare me. Then he tells me that just like there are good and bad people, there are good and bad ghosts, and that none of the bad ghosts would ever hurt anyone in the hotel because his wife would protect them. I asked where his wife was, and he said, Oh, she's dead. I was thinking to myself, Dude, you're crazy. He then proceeds to tell me the story about his wife. She died of cancer, and she made him a promise that if there was any way to stick around after death, she'd find it, and she'd watch over the place and anyone who stayed there forever. After she died, he named one of the rooms after her, and on her birthday, he had some ghost hunters come out to try to communicate with her. They all went into the room named after her, and he wished her a happy birthday. He told her he hoped she knows how much he loved her and really missed her. One of the ghost hunters said out loud, If there's anything you want to tell him, now's the time. Later on, while listening back to the tape, they heard a woman's voice say, Tell him I know. I actually thought that was pretty sweet. But then I asked him about that thing that held me down to the bed. He told me that he had no idea who or what it was, but apparently I got off easy. He told me the first time he stayed in that room, he actually got bruised and cut and sprained his arm because he fought it so hard. The night in that hotel was the most scared I've ever been in my life, and it made me a true believer in the afterlife without a doubt, especially after hearing that little girl's voice. In high school, my girlfriend and I were on the ROTC rifle team. We'd stay after school until 7 p.m., practicing our marksmanship in the school basement. After practice every night, her mom would pick us up in the parking lot outside the band room, which was also in the basement and connected to the ROTC offices. So we would hang around the band room looking out the window, waiting for her. The night this happened, it was winter, so it was cold outside and dark because it was after 7 the whole building was empty, except for us and our sergeant major, a retired Vietnam vet who was and still is the bravest badass I've ever met. So my girlfriend and I were in the band room waiting for her mom, and the sergeant major was in his office. It was quiet, and we were standing there for a good 15 minutes alone, just talking, when suddenly, out of nowhere, a huge set of double tubular bells started shaking violently, making all kinds of noise. They were about five feet away from me, and they must have weighed well over 300 pounds because they were a double set made of brass and steel. Suddenly, they shot across the room, flipping over end to end about three or four times. It was like someone had picked them up and thrown them, as if they weighed nothing. I tore out of there as fast as I physically could, working on pure adrenaline. 
I left my girlfriend to fend for herself. No chivalry there. I was just too scared. I didn't say, Are you okay? Did you see that? No, just whoosh, and I was gone. I ran to the sergeant major's office, and before I could get one word out of my mouth, my girlfriend was there beside me, crying her eyes out. We both explained to the sergeant what happened, and he kept telling us to just calm down. Then he walked with us back to the band room to check things out. And sure enough, the 300-pound bells were now on the floor on the opposite side from where they had just been. The sergeant major didn't say anything. He just took us back to his office and told us to wait with him until my girlfriend's mother came. Try as I might, I can't figure out how that happened. It wasn't a prank. There were no other people in the building. And I highly doubt anyone could lift a set of 300-pound bells, much less throw them across the room end to end. This happened to me over 20 years ago, and I've been searching for a legitimate explanation ever since. And I have yet to find one. Last winter, I kept having horrible night terrors with a side of sleep paralysis. I'm talking four or five times a week. I'd wake my boyfriend up by thrashing around and trying to scream. It would always start the same way. It felt like my body was humming, as if there were electricity running through my veins, and I was unable to move or speak. Even worse, during these episodes, it always felt like there was some kind of evil presence in the room. It would talk to me in my head, and it had a really scary voice. This was so real that once I was able to move again, I'd wake my boyfriend up and we'd go through the entire house looking for, well, monsters for lack of a better word. Of course, we never found anything. This bothered me so much that I turned to the internet for some answers. I wanted to know how to make it stop. I found two suggestions that seemed easy and doable. One was to slowly try moving a finger or a toe, just enough to wake yourself up. And the other was to calmly talk to yourself in your head, again, until you were able to wake yourself up. Well, that night it happened again. My body was humming with electricity, but I hadn't yet felt the presence of evil in the room. I immediately started trying to wiggle my fingers, while at the same time singing to myself in my head. Now I'm a mom of a four-year-old. She was three at the time, and the only song I could think of was, If You're Happy and You Know It. So there I was, trying to stay calm and wake myself up by singing a children's song in my head, when that feeling of the evil presence entered the room. Now I was desperately trying to wake myself up, but I just couldn't seem to do it. So I started repeating to myself in my head, It's not real. It's not real. You're just dreaming. This is not real. That's when I heard the thing say to me, Oh yeah? Watch this. Literally two seconds later, my then three-year-old daughter started screaming in the next room. My boyfriend jumped out of bed and ran to her. She was crying and said, did you see what Grandma just did? She said her grandma showed up out of nowhere and in a loud, scary voice started screaming in her face. Mind you, this all happened mere seconds after that thing told me to watch this if I thought it wasn't real. And my daughter's grandma lives in another state. No one was in her room, let alone her grandmother. I didn't get much sleep that night nor for the next few weeks. In fact, it took me months to be able to sleep through the night again. I've had a few other episodes since then, but none of them as horrifying as that one. The house I grew up in was built in the 1800s, and the basement door that's located in the kitchen needs a skeleton key. There'd been some break-ins in the neighborhood, 
and it would be pretty easy to break into our basement, then come up into the main part of the house. So we kept that door locked at all times. One night my parents were out, and I was home alone. I locked the basement door and kept the key on a chain around my neck. I was up in my room doing homework, and I wanted a soda, so I walked down the stairs to the kitchen, only to find the basement door wide open. I froze, thinking that someone had broken in. But then I realized that no one could be in the house because the floorboards squeaked so badly. If anyone had walked up those stairs, I'd have heard them, and I hadn't heard a thing. So I closed and locked the door again, and I pulled on the handle to make sure it was secure, and went back to my room. As soon as I sat down, I realized I'd forgotten to get my soda, so I went back down to the kitchen, only to find the basement door open once again. Now I knew I'd locked at that time, so I was wondering what was going on, but I wasn't scared. I just locked it again, made sure it was secured, and turned to get my soda from the fridge, which was about three feet away. When I closed the refrigerator and turned around, the basement door was wide open again. I hadn't heard a thing. I stood there for a moment in shock. Then slowly and warily I approached the door to close it and lock it yet again. But this time when I closed it, something slammed against it hard from the other side. So hard that the door vibrated. That was all I needed. I ran upstairs and locked myself in the bedroom. A few days later, I told my dad what happened. All he did was look at me and say, Why do you think I moved my workbench from the basement to the garage? My dad was driving home from Las Vegas back to Lancaster, California in the 1980s. He stopped to relieve himself on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. He said it was pitch black outside and there was no one around, not even any cars. Suddenly, he began to hear whispering all around him, surrounding him on all sides. An overwhelming sense of fear hit him and he nearly fell over his own two feet trying to make it back to the car. He said it was the most scared he's ever been. When he arrived home at 5 a.m. the following morning, Mom and Grandma were freaking out, wondering what had happened to him. You see, Dad had left Las Vegas at 8 p.m. the previous night, and it's only a three-hour drive back home. He had lost six hours of time, and he still has no idea what happened to him that night. This happened when I was seven years old. I forgot my favorite pillow downstairs after family movie night, so I went down into the finished basement to get it before going to bed. I got the pillow and looked up to see a man on the other side of the room. He was just looking around, paying no attention to me whatsoever. The weirdest thing was that he was entirely gray, head to toe, skin color, clothing, hair, everything gray. I just stared at him, completely terrified. He looked up, realized I could see him, then he opened his mouth and unhinged his jaw, almost like he was screaming at me, but he made no sound. Then he walked right through the wall and disappeared. After that, I couldn't go downstairs alone at night until I was a teenager. When I was 10 years old, I had a doll in my room. It was a non-articulated doll, which means it had no moving limbs or parts. It was kept on a stand so it could be displayed without tipping over. One night I awoke from a deep sleep around two in the morning. I don't know why, but my eyes were drawn to the doll across the room. I could see its silhouette on the wall in the soft moonlight. Suddenly, it bent forward at the waist and turned to look at me. 
I stared at it, and it stared back at me for what seemed like a full minute. I was too afraid to move. To make sure that this was real, I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again, the doll was standing upright. But just as I was about to breathe a sigh of relief, the doll moved again. My whole life I've tried to convince myself that I was only dreaming, yet I know I was awake. I was out on a hike, and I noticed some deer bones on the side of the trail. It's common for deer to be killed by a coyote, but what I saw next was decidedly uncommon. There was a pelvis bone of a deer in the crook of a tree. Further down the path, I saw the severed head of a deer that had been neatly placed on the branch of another tree. Throughout my hike, I realized that someone had physically placed the severed parts of freshly killed deer carcasses on the ground and in the trees along the trail. It was pretty damn unsettling. My boyfriend and I were backpacking one day, and we passed a distracted woman wearing a blue sweatshirt. She was running full tilt down the trail, carrying a shovel. We didn't think much of it, that is, until we passed by her ten minutes later. She was burying a stroller, a pack of diapers, baby clothes, baby toys, and the blue sweatshirt. Hmm... My friend and I were playing hide-and-seek. I hid behind the garage while she looked for me. About 20 feet away from my hiding place was a swing that hung from a tree branch. I saw my friend walking towards the swing, and I decided that I was going to sneak up behind her and scare her. As she got near the swing, she reached out her hand and said, Found you! At that very same time, I grabbed her shoulders from behind. She turned around and saw me and all the color drained from her face. She said, How did you do that? I just saw you on the swing. How did you get behind me? She swore she saw me sitting on that swing. It scared the crap out of me, because I had been looking at that swing, and I knew there was nobody on it. To this day, I can't explain it. I lived in a haunted house growing up. We'd often hear footsteps walking up and down the stairs when there was no one there. This was more annoying than scary, though, because the ghost would do it all night long. The scariest thing that happened in that house was the night it sounded like every pot and pan in the kitchen was being banged together, thrown around, and slammed against the stove. It also sounded like every window downstairs was being thrown open, then aggressively slammed shut. It was loud, and it went on for the better part of the night. My brother ran across the hall to my younger brother's room because he was afraid to sleep alone. I, however, just hid under the covers, too afraid to even move. Of course, the next morning when we cautiously ventured downstairs to inspect the damages, absolutely nothing was out of place. I grew up in a neighborhood that was built over an old graveyard. About 70 graves still remain there. A bunch of us used a Ouija board at my friend's house one night when I was 12 years old, and it turned out to be pretty disastrous. I became so ill a few days later, I had to be hospitalized, and another kid's dad died in his sleep that very night, and he was only 32 years old. Then my friend gave the Ouija board to some other kids down the block. They stayed up all night using it, and early the next morning, their house caught on fire. The kids made it out, but the parents didn't. They died in that fire. 
Yes, it could all be a coincidence, but I don't mess around with those boards anymore. The day I found out my wife was going to have a baby girl, I called my grandma to tell her the news. She was thrilled. But less than three hours later, my sister called to tell me that Grandma had died. I was heartbroken. We named our daughter Viola after her. Fast forward a year. My wife was giving our daughter a bath, and I was in the living room alone. There was one of those magic slate toys on the table next to me. You know, the toy with the little pen attached to it, and you can draw or write on it and then swipe it to erase it? I was distracted playing on my phone, not paying any attention. My wife came in the room and said, Did you write that? And she pointed to the toy. I looked and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Right there on that toy, plain as day, was written in cursive the name Viola. Number one, I can't write cursive. And number two, that was my grandma's handwriting. I recently bought an old home. The previous owner had very unique looking wallpaper in every room of the house, even on the ceilings. I've been taking it down so I can paint. Removing it was like tearing skin off the walls. As I took it down, I noticed that in a corner section on each one of the rooms was written a person's name along with a date on the wall beneath. Curious, I looked up one of the names on the internet and it belonged to a missing person and the date on the wall was the last day they were seen alive. Each one of the names in every room belonged to a missing person, and the date they were last seen. I called the police and they came over with the forensics team. After they ran some tests, a policeman asked me, Ma'am, where's the material you've already taken down from the walls? It wasn't wallpaper you've been removing. <laughs> 